And here's an overview slide of everything that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about the four different types of vaccines, which you see here on this slide. And as I go through this video, we'll talk about the physiology of how these vaccines are working. So we'll kind of describe what's happening uh, on the immunological level. We'll talk about um, some cautions or adverse reactions that you should be familiar with, with with each of these different types of vaccines. And then maybe even the highest yield part of this video is actually the different examples. So we'll talk about the different viruses and bacteria that have vaccines in each of these four categories, because unfortunately on USMLE and Comlex, it's fair game to have to know that information. For example, to know that smallpox is a live attenuated vaccine, but that HPV is a subunit vaccine. So you, you have to know what type of vaccine each of the different vaccines um, actually are. And that's what I'm going to go through in addition to just all that background science that you need to know. So let's go through these topics, uh, these different types of vaccines one at a time. And by the end of this video, you'll be an expert on the, the different types of vaccines, the physiology and the examples. So let's begin with live attenuated vaccines. So personally, I'm a huge advocate of looking at words, looking at prefixes and suffixes to help you understand what a phrase or a medical term is referring to. And if you didn't know what the word attenuated means, if you look that up and do a Google dictionary search, what that word means is having been reduced in force, effect, or value. So if you know the definition of attenuated and you think about the phrase live attenuated vaccine, it makes perfect sense what these vaccines actually are. So in a nutshell, a live attenuated vaccine is a vaccine that contains a microorganism and that microorganism can still infect the host technically if it becomes introduced. But generally speaking, it's it's um, it had its pathogenicity taken away. So it's safe to give it in a vaccine because typically we have enough immune response present to not let it go out of control, but it'll induce a humoral and cellular response. And that's what we want as the physicians and the scientists giving these vaccines. Some cautions that you should be aware of with a live attenuated vaccine is that the microorganism technically has the ability to revert back to its virulent form. And what this means is that when you give somebody a live attenuated vaccine, generally speaking, in your normal person who has a normal immune response, this won't happen because you've taken the pathogenicity away from the microorganism. However, if you're going to give this to somebody who's immunocompromised or pregnant, it has the you know, the ability to go and cause a very dangerous infection because even though you've taken away the pathogenicity of the microorganism, that microorganism still does have the ability technically to infect the host once it's introduced. So if you were going to conceptualize this, the, the bottom line here is that the live attenuated vaccines are technically the most risky because they can revert to their virulent form and really cause that infection. And it's for this reason that it's usually contraindicated in pregnant patients and immunocompromised patients. Now that said, the one really high yield thing that you should know is that you can still give a live attenuated vaccine to an HIV positive patient if they're not already immune to one of these live attenuated vaccines. But in order to do so, you have to ensure that their CD4 count is greater than 200. Otherwise, they could really become sick very quickly. Now, what's the highest yield part of today's video? It's knowing the examples of the different vaccines that correspond to each of these four categories. So for live attenuated vaccines, what are the examples? Well, there are measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, polio, and specifically the Sabin polio vaccine, adenovirus, the influenza or flu vaccine, but only the intranasal version of it, rotavirus, and smallpox. Now, I know what you're, you're saying. You're sitting there and you're watching this video and you just pooped in your pants and you, you're like, oh my God, dirty. I'm never going to be able to learn this list. What the heck, man? Well, it, it's actually a lot easier than this. So I'm going to reorganize this and give you my mnemonic. So um, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, polio, adenovirus, influenza, rotavirus, and smallpox. The way that I've always remembered this going back years now is, mmm, really vivacious pairs of vaccines. Now, why does this work? Well, vivacious means lively, and this is live attenuated vaccine. So my mnemonic with the word vivacious is goes with the live attenuated vaccines, because after all, the term vivacious means lively. So mmm, really vivacious pairs of vaccines. Mmm, M and M for measles and mumps, the R in really for the R in rubella, 
the V in vivacious for the V in varicella. And again, vivacious means lively. And we're talking about live attenuated vaccines. And then PAIRS, P-A-I-R-S for the P in polio, the A in adenovirus, the I in influenza and intranasal, the R in rotavirus, and the S in smallpox. So when you're sitting there on test day and they ask you which of the following is a live attenuated vaccine, you're going to go live. Lively means vivacious. Mmm, really vivacious pairs of vaccines. And you're going to remember exactly what the examples of the live attenuated vaccines are. You're welcome. I just got you all a free point on test day. Crushing it. That's it, guys. That's all you need to know for live attenuated vaccines. Let's move on to the killed, also known as inactivated vaccines. So a killed or an inactivated vaccine, you can see it um, referred to as either killed or inactivated, means the same thing. In this case, what's happening is you get a humoral response. And typically, they take the pathogen, the scientists do, and the pathogen gets inactivated. And that can happen either through chemical means or like hyperheating something to extreme temperatures and you heat it or you chemically, you know, mess with it, I guess I'm not the PhD here, um, but you change it in such a way that it's inactivated. And when that happens, you get this humoral response. But what's really interesting is that the surface antigen epitope, the maintenance of that epitope is required for immunity. So if there's some kind of, uh, if it gets messed up at all, or there's some uh, type of mutation, it's, your immunity can can wane, okay? So the, the takeaway here is that these are referred to as killed or inactivated because you take chemicals and heating processes and you kill or inactivate the pathogen. And then when you do that, you put it in the vaccine, you give it to the host, and you induce this humoral response. Um, again, remember, and it's very high yield, I should have put it in red, that that surface antigen epitope, you have to maintain it on the surface in order to get that immune response because the body is only seeing the surface of these killed pathogens. Now, what are the cautions here? Well, it requires boosters throughout your life. Um, boosters are usually required in types of vaccines that are, that are technically weaker. So if it induces a weaker immune response, then you give these boosters because you're trying to boost that immune system every so many years. And again, um, sort of, I, I've already touched on this, but it, it's a technically weaker immune response uh, for the reason that it's killed by chemical and heating, and the body's only recognizing the surface antigen epitopes. Now, what are the types of killed or inactivated vaccines? Well, it's hepatitis A, rabies, influenza, but in this case, the intramuscular form. So the, the intranasal, we already talked about, the intranasal form was live attenuated, but the intramuscular form, so the needle, that's killed. And then the sulk subtype of polio vaccine. So again, we talked about one type of polio vaccine, the Sabin, which was in live attenuated, but the Salk polio vaccine is killed. Now, how do you remember this? Well, when you think of someone who's been killed, you think of them being buried in a graveyard and you say rest in peace or RIP. So uh, in the killed or inactivated vaccines, these always rest in peace. They always, A for always, for the A in hepatitis A, uh, R in rest for the R in rabies, the I in in for the I in influenza or intramuscular, and the P in peace for the P in polio. So killed vaccines always rest in peace because they're killed. So when someone's killed, they rest in peace. Um, that's really it. Not that many to know here. Easier to memorize, I would say, than the live attenuated vaccines. But something that's really important that you should take away from this video that, that's incredibly high yield, I, I don't, don't ask me why, but it shows up all the time, are these two different types of polio vaccines. So you've got the Salk and the Sabin, okay? And you need to know which one is live attenuated and which one is killed. And there's easy ways to know this. So basically the K in Salk stands for the K in killed. And you can either do process of elimination and only memorize that, or if you want to take it one step further, the in at the end of Sabin, save in for enthusiastic or lively, right? So someone who's really enthusiastic is really lively. So the Sabin vaccine is live attenuated. So Sabin for enthusiastic, lively, live, and the K in Salk for the K in killed. So know which one goes into which category. I don't know why it's so high yield, but don't ask me, test writers just love it. So that's what you need to know for killed or inactivated vaccines. And at this point in the video, we've now gone through half of the material that you need to know. 
And the truth is, is that the last two on this slide, the subunit vaccines, which we'll talk about next, and the toxoid vaccines, which we'll conclude with at the end of this video, are a lot easier than the two that we've already talked about. So you're kind of cruising now. So let's talk about the subunit vaccines. So I think this is probably best illustrated with a little picture that I made. So let's imagine that you have this pathogen. Pathogens have lots of different antigens on their surface that the body recognizes and, and that triggers our immune system. And when scientists make the subunit vaccines, what they do is they take the pathogen and they look for the one specific antigen that best stimulates the immune response in the human body. And they isolate that specific antigen and then put that in the subunit vaccine. And that's where the term subunit comes from. They're taking one subunit or one antigen that preferentially activates immune responses and that's what the vaccine is made of. So on this pathogen surface, let's say that there's a specific antigen, which on this slide is depicted by the green triangle. They take that and they put it in the vaccine. And an example of what a specific antigen could be would be like the capsular polysaccharide that they take off of encapsulated bacteria such as Neisseria meningitidis, Strep pneumoniae, and Haemophilus influenza type B, because those are all encapsulated bacteria. And by introducing this in, as a subunit in a subunit vaccine, it preferentially activates the immune system to target those encapsulated bacteria. So again, the physiology here is that we're taking a specific antigen subunit that best activates the immune system. And this really has a very low chance of adverse vaccine reactions because it's so specifically targeted that it, there's really nothing else that can happen here. Some cautions, well, these tend to cost more money. That obviously won't show up on your exam, but it's just good to know. And these do induce an arguably weaker immune response. As far as the different types of subunit vaccines, you see them here. Hepatitis B, strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitidis, H influenza type B, pertussis, and human papillomavirus, or HPV. Now, the, the mnemonic here is kind of tricky, I'll say. This is probably my most esoteric mnemonic that I'm going to put in this video. And the reason that I'm doing it is because these are a really random assortment of, of uh, pathogens that are included in the subunit category. Before I even get into this, what you could just memorize if you're trying to conserve the limited amount of brain space that you have for, for USMLE or Comlex is that subunit vaccines target encapsulated bacteria. Because if you know the three encapsulated bacteria that I've already mentioned, S. pneumonia, N. meningitidis, and H. influenza type B, you're probably going to get most, if not all, of these questions correct. But if you really want to go the extra mile and know that hepatitis B, pertussis, and HPV are also in this category, then here's my silly mnemonic. So when I think of subunit, I'm going to rearrange these uh, pathogens that you see here. And instead of subunit, I think about the B unit. And to me, the B unit sounds like a gang. So I say that the B unit vaccines are capping your ass. I just imagine like this gang known as the B unit and they go around capping people, right? Old school gang B unit, the B unit gang. So the B unit vaccines are capping your ass. Now, what does this mnemonic tell you? Well, B unit, B for hepatitis B, the U in unit for the U in pneumonia, the N in unit for the N in N meningitidis, the I for influenza type B, the T for the T in pertussis, and the V in vaccines for HPV. And the reason that I'm, I use cap in your ass, cap in is a slang term for like, you know, murdering or something, uh, is because these are used to target the encapsulated bacteria. So I think of cap in or cap like encapsulated. So I know it's a really stupid mnemonic. I apologize. But if you're really looking for something here, then this is what I used and, you know, it worked. So that's that's it for the subunit vaccines. Let's conclude by talking about toxoid vaccines. So the way that a toxoid vaccine works is basically really well depicted on this image that I found on the internet. So uh, step one, get the bacteria. And in this case, the example is showing diphtheria. Step two is take the toxin from the bacteria. Step three is denature that toxin, modify it, but be sure to leave the receptor binding site in place. So this is really cool, right? They take the bacteria, get the toxin from it, and then basically modify the toxin just a little bit so that it doesn't cause the disease, 
uh, but is still it still looks like the toxin so that our immune system would recognize the toxin if it recognizes the toxoid. So if if you don't know this, the 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 term oid at the end of words means like. So toxoid means like a toxin. Anything that has oid at the end means it's that like, right? So opioid is like an opiate. Toxoid is like a toxin. So that, that's where that phrase comes from. So again, toxoid vaccines are like toxins. And that makes sense because if you look at the physiology here of what's going on, you're taking the toxin and you're just changing it a little bit and you're making the vaccine like the toxin, which is why it's called toxoid. So the physiology, again, everything I just said, bacterial toxin is adapted and you have to leave that intact receptor binding site. This does cause an antibody response, but it doesn't cause the disease. Cautions here, uh, these do require some boosters over time. There's only two toxoid vaccines that you need to know, so this is pretty easy to memorize. This is Clostridium tetani and Cronibacterium diphtheriae. So tetanus and diphtheria. Shouldn't be that hard to memorize, but just in case you do need a mnemonic, toxoid starts with T, ends with D, tetanus and diphtheria for T and D. So guys, ladies, gentlemen, and anybody else who does not identify, there you go. You now know the four different types of vaccines, which include live attenuated, killed, aka inactivated, subunit, and toxoid. If you're going to learn one thing from this video because you don't feel like memorizing everything that I went through, just know the different examples and which category they fall into. But if you want to be a really well-spoken and knowledgeable physician, then I do advise you to know everything can, uh, contained in this video. So that's it. Click the link in the description. Sign up to be a patron of Dirty Medicine. Love you all. Good luck.